Welcome everybody all over the world. Welcome to this AO trauma webcast on surgical hip dislocation for the treatment of acetabular fractures. Welcome here at the AMTS in Basel. Uh, we have more than 650 subscribers all over the world from more than five, uh, for, for all, from basically all those five continents. My name is Moritz Tanast. I'm an orthopedic surgeon working at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And I would like to introduce uh, the surgeon from today. It's Professor Siebenrock, uh, is uh, chairman and also an orthopedic surgeon working at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery in Bern. I would also like to introduce our surgical team. From left, left to right, we have Bettina Breu, who is our scrub tech for today. We have Dr. Andrea Ruda, he's from Brazil and working as an AO fellow in Davos right now. We have Simon Steppacher, who is a senior resident at our department. And we have, uh, last but not least, Till Lerch on the right side, who is working as a resident in our department. They will assist us during surgery today. And uh, maybe we can just start and go ahead with the learning objectives, what you should learn during the first or the next 90 minutes. Klaus, please. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. What are the learning objectives today? It's explain anatomical key points and essential steps to correctly perform the technique for safe surgical hip dislocation for fracture treatment. Second, to describe indications for this approach and become familiar with different reduction maneuvers and surgical instruments. And third, recognize advantages and limits of safe surgical hip dislocation for acetabular fracture treatment. These are the 10 types the acetabular fractures as have been described by Letonel. On the upper row you have the five essential fracture types and on the lower row the more complex associated fracture types. And six out of these 10 fracture types are apt for a posterior approach, are accessible through a posterior approach. And these are namely a posterior wall fracture, posterior column, transverse fracture in the majority of cases. And if you look at the combined fractures, it's posterior column and posterior wall, T-shaped fracture, and transverse associated with posterior wall fractures. So the classic posterior approach has been described by Kocher more than 100 years back. It's the so-called combined Kocher-Langenbeck approach and it's a posterior approach typically addressing these six fracture types. What are limitations of the Kocher-Langenbeck approach? There's some limited visibility, there's no option for a real dislocation of the femoral head, there's some lack of re external references. Screw placement cannot be seen reliably intraarticular, and there is also limited access to femoral head lesions. In addition, it's difficult to repair any torn labrum. This is a case treated by a Kochel Langenbeck approach, and you see this is a severely medially displaced, displaced T-shaped fracture. It was addressed through the Kocher Langenbeck approach, but reduction is not perfect, as you also can see by the lower pubic ramus. And only after 1.6 years follow up, you see already narrowing of the joint space and osteoarthritis. So, what are the negative predictors for outcome in acetabular fractures? It's non anatomical reduction, involvement of the posterior wall, femoral head cartilage lesions, marginal impaction and residual joint incongruence. And in order to improve our results, there is a need for an approach with safe and full access to the acetabulum and femoral head. So this is the area of access you will have on the left side by the kocher langenbeck approach. It's the retroacetabular area, some portion of the ileum and the ischium, and you can reach the quadrilateral surface digitally with your finger. With a trochanteric flip extension, you can reach higher up on the ileum and all the way to the inferior iliac spine. And if you extend this approach with a full surgical hip dislocation, you can even 
enter the entire hip joint and have a visual control over the entire acetabulum and femoral head and portions of the anterior column. So what are indications for safe surgical hip dislocation? It's marginal impaction, typically in combination with the comminution and multifragmentary posterior wall fractures, intraarticular fractures, anterior superior acetabular rim fractures extending to the iliac spine. The advantage also and indication is if you have to check reduction, especially in multifragmentary fragments, and make sure that placement of your screws plates and uh, typically the placement of the anterior column screw is correct. In addition and last, it's a way to treat Pitkin fractures that means femoral head fractures in combination with a posterior head dislocation. So in order to perform this approach safely without risking damage to the femoral head, you actually have to know about the blood supply to the femoral head. And Moritz Tanners now will go on and explain you anatomically in more details the course of this vessel. So this is really the prerequisite for doing any type of surgery to the acetabulum on from the posterior side. Even if you are doing a classic cochlear lumbar approach, it's very important that you know the course of the artery that really provides the blood supply to the femoral head. Let's go back to the presentation. So the main um, blood supply to the femoral head comes from the deep branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery. And this artery basically comes from anterior, it runs between the femur and the pelvis, and then finally it supplies the femoral head from posterior. This is a view from anterior. The origin of this, uh, this uh, artery is the deep femoral artery, and then it runs between the iliopsoas muscle and the pectineus muscle posteriorly. It then runs along the inferior border of the obturator externus muscle. And this is now a view from posterior. It's then covered by the quadratus femoris muscle and it lies on top, so posterior to the obturator externus muscle. There is a very constant branch which is given at this point, which uh, usually goes to the greater trochanter which runs in between the quadratus femoris muscle and the triceps coxae muscle. So this is a very good anatomical landmark uh, during surgery too. The artery or the deep branch of the artery then finally undercrosses the triceps coxae and it then finally enters uh, the joint capsule between the gemellus superior and the piriformis muscles. We have four to five retinacular vessels which uh, finally go into the femoral epiphysis. This is now a view from a specimen with some intra-arterial venous uh, contrast agent. It's green marked, so you can see here from post here on a specimen, on the top there is the greater trochanter, on the left would be the head of the patient, on the right the foot of the patient. Uh, on the right side we have the quadratus femoris muscle and here you can see how this artery uh, overcrosses the obturator externus muscle and dives then under the gemellus inferior muscle. And here is a view directly on the acetabulum, so from posterior superior. On the right side, the greater trochanter is already osteotomized and the retinaculum is open. And here you can very nicely see the vessels running into the epiphysis of the femoral head. Uh, usually we have three to five of those branches which really have to be protected, otherwise you will end up in an avascular necrosis of the femoral head. So this is really the prerequisite. Let's move on to the patient positioning before we start with surgery. So typically, and this is uh, in contrary to the, to the classical Koch-Langebeck approach, the patient is placed in a lateral decubitus position. We use this pillow in between the two legs so that the operate leg is really in a stable position. The surgeon stands posteriorly to the patient and we typically have two to three assistants. So one on the same side as the surgeon and two typically on the other side. I think we are now ready for surgery and I will hand over to Klaus so that he can give you some external landmarks on the skin and where he would place the incision. Klaus? Thank you, Moritz. Um, 
We are here in the operation theater. I switched to my team here on the table. You see the patient in the left, the cubitus position. To the upper side here, to the left side, this would be towards the head, and this is uh, towards uh, the leg. I've uh, drawn some landmarks here. That's the anterior superior iliac spine anteriorly. And you see this line is uh, outlining here the iliac crest up here. In the middle of my incision, this is the greater to handle here. And my incision is basically going through the center of the greater to handle. It's probably like 20 centimeters in length. Knife, please. So we start with this incision here. I will do it a little bit more extensive so we have a better view for the cameras to show the anatomic uh, details. Zweites Messer. So that's a skin incision, as we have marked it before. We go to the subcutaneous fat tissue. I want to go down all the way to the fascia layer, which is the fascia, the tensor fascia lata down here. So sharp the retractors, please. You can see it's a, a rather skinny patient. And that's what you ha rarely have in surgery, in real life. Put this up. Pick up. Thank you. We go here down through the fatty tissue, down to the fascia. Actually, you probably know that the Kocher Langenbeck approach is an angled approach. No? It's not in line like this. And it angles more posteriorly. And it actually goes through, it cuts through the gluteus maximus muscle. So this is something we avoid or we don't want to do. We want to go to the so-called Gibson interval, which means it's the interval between the gluteus maximus and the tensor fasciolata in front. So it's actually an internervous uh, approach. So the first way, or a good way probably to start and to find this interval is when you start distally and you incise the tensor here over the vastus lateralis muscle. In order to relax this, you have to lift it up a little bit. Huh? Okay, go further down. I do a little bit extension of the approach here so we have a better overview. Which you have probably a schematic drawing of this uh, approach over here. So this is actually where we are. So we see now from lateral uh, onto this patient and the basic goal is to go uh, to the anterior border of the gluteus maximus muscle which is then retracted posteriorly so that it can have basically a direct view on the gluteus medius muscle, the greater trochanter and the vastus lateralis muscle. So in contrast to the classic Koch langebeck approach, uh, we try to retract the gluteus maximus uh, completely posteriorly and we're not, try, we're not trying to divide it, to split it. That's the main difference just from the superficial dissection uh, to, the, to the classic approach. We go back to the surgery, Klaus. We still have um, a little difficulty finding the, the interval up here. In real life, you will have uh, some anastomosis in a proximal portion of the um, uh, maximus muscle. Hold it like this a little bit. Thank you. So, Klaus, this is basically a step or problem that we uh, are faced to sometimes if we cannot really correctly find or there's, it's difficult to find this interval. So there are different tips and tricks how you can actually improve that. So one of those uh, tricks is if you start from inferior, so you are typically 
directly over the vastus lateralis muscle and then you prepare yourself more proximately. And the other option is that you start from proximally, you see the shiny gluteus maximus muscle and you prepare anteriorly in order to have uh, the, uh, the vessels coming out from in between the, the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius. So those branches from the inferior gluteal artery are typically quite nicely visible and then you can try really to uh, cut the tractus as you can see right here and you can get quite properly into the interval that we've just seen before. One way also in, in order to separate this uh, muscle or the muscle layers is to put, your, as I do now, to put the finger in between uh, the, um, your interval between, this is the gluteus medius up here, and uh, lift away or hold away the uh, maximus posteriorly like I do now at, at this point. Huh? So. Klaus, when you are at this point uh, with the classic Kocher-Langebeck approach, uh, usually the tendon of the gluteus maximus is torn or is, is just cut to gain more access to the posterior aspect of the pelvis. Do you usually do that with this approach or uh, is it not necessary? You mean... Uh, Insertion of the gluteus maximus posteriorly. Um, I shall just show you in a second. So I retract now here the, the maximus muscle posteriorly. And you can see here the extension here or the, the insertion of the gluteus maximus on the posterior aspect on the femur. So one way to gain more access to this uh, retroacetabular area is to put the leg as you probably can see now, in, in, in an extension and maximum internal rotation. This opens the retro trochanteric space over here. In some cases, if the patient is very obese or muscular, you can dissect or cut through the tendon here posteriorly, and uh, then you may gain more access. So this patient is rather skinny and small, so I think it's not necessary. I would say 95% of the cases I'm not uh, forced to do so. So what we see now is the insertion of the gluteus maximus here. This is how far we have to go distally. We see a structure coming up here. That's the vastus lateralis muscle. Here, the greater hand is covered by a rather thick borsa, which is, looks a little bit uh, uh, brownish here and red. So that's the borsa are in size on the posterior aspect of the greater tohander in order to further expose uh, this retro tohanteric space. So you see here, you see here already some reddish structure coming through. I think you can see it nicely here. This is a, a rather large muscle coming up and this muscle is the quadratus femoris muscle here. I think you can see it. Huh? It ranges, uh, the, the width is from here, from a knife down to there. Huh? Yes, we can see it very nicely. So <coughs> the next step now, I expose the posterior aspect of the greater tohander, is to further open the retro tohanteric space. And uh, what I want to see is actually the inferior border of the gluteus medius muscle, which comes through here. Some are shining through here. Schmalo Langenberg, bitte. And we want to retract this granularly, like this. Give me a knife, please. In order to see and to identify the underlying external rotators. So in some situations, you might be interested um, where you might find the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is best found, 
on the muscle here, on the quadratus femoris. No? It's running over these external rotators down in the depth here. We have some crossing vessels, as you see here, there's some anastomosis, especially here, you, up here, you can see anastomosis from the inter, uh, inferior cluteal vessels running actually towards the crater to handle and uh, connecting with the uh, meter femoral circumflex artery. Now I've exposed, if you go for the nerve and if you have fractures, we have some comminution back here, you have some laceration of the muscles. If you go for the nerve, go over the quadratus femoris muscle into the depth and then you will find it. You can see it here nicely. Huh? Now here's the anastomosis just for exposure. Um, I just uh, cut it just to give you a better overview. You usually don't have to do, it, do this in a standard approach for safe surgical dislocation. But remember, we are dealing now with an approach for fracture treatment. So before you do anything on a greater to handle, it's good to expose this posterior aspect here in order to identify all your muscles and your structure so you know where you are. And actually, again, for anatomy, this here is the quadratus femoris muscle here, ranging all the way down. Then you have gemelli muscle, inferior, superior, and in between you can feel it's rather, you rather can palpate it than seeing it right now. This is uh, the tendon of the obturator internus muscle. And all the way up here, you see this white structure. That's already the piriformis tendon coming out. I think you can nicely see that. And the trick now is, especially at this moment, to enter the interval between the piriformis tendon and the gluteus minimus muscle cranially. So the torn muscle, typically, of course, yeah, the, the bleeding is a little bit less than I'm used to today, but uh, usually you find torn muscles here in this area. It's uh, the gemella superior. You have a posterior wall fragments sticking out here, going through the muscle. Um, sometimes the tendon or piriformis muscle is lacerated, and most frequently, up here, the minimus muscle, which is attached to the capsule, actually, and to the ilium, is lacerated. And there's quite some bleeding. And if there's a lot of damage, um, I think the treatment is essential. should get rid of that muscle, because this is, I think, one uh, risk factor for heterotopic ossification. So the treatment of the muscle is important at this point, um, just for avoiding this, and also for better visualization of your posterior wall fractures. So now you can see, Schmaler Langenbeck, I've clearly identified an interval between the piriformis tendon, um, he can hold it, hold it, there it is, between the piriformis tendon here and the gluteus minimus cranially. I think it's visible on the screen, isn't it, Messer? Yes. So that's all done in a moment or a period of surgery where the tohander is still intact. Why? Because once you cut the greater tohander, bleeding will start from the bone. And so you have uh, less visualization about your structure. So you have all external rotators, the sciatic nerve, everything in front of you. Nochmal Langenbeck groß. Okay, now we go on the posterior, we continue to go on the posterior aspect of the greater tohander. And we go down all the way to the vastus lateralis muscle, as you would do in a standard approach, in a lateral approach to the femur. So, let's have here again einen Hohmann. So you can see this white structure here. This is the vastus lateralis originating here from the so-called innominate tubercle. It's just retracted, so I can see or have exposed femoral bone. Messer noch mal. So in order to do the osteotomy, 
and actually we're doing a step cut osteotomy. I just draw this line with my knife and this would be like a flat osteotomy here. So the proximal portion of the osteotomy will exactly be the same like doing just a standard or we may say maybe a little bit old-fashioned flat trochanteric osteotomy. I feel underneath the posterior superior portion of the greater trochanter. Actually, my finger now is in a piriformis fossa, and I make sure that my saw blade, that the cut doesn't go too much medial. Klaus, yeah. before you do the cut, let's just go to the presentation so that everybody can imagine where exactly you would place uh, the osteotomy saw. So again, this is the view from post here, and you always have to keep in mind exactly where your medial femoral circumflex artery runs. So again, quadratus femoris, that's something that we have seen. We have the triceps coxa that we have seen, and then the proximal end of your osteotomy should just leave a little bit of the gluteus medius attached to the stable portion of the greater choke hander. So this makes sure that your osteotomy is not too medial, putting the medial femoral circumflex artery in danger. So this is the osteotomy as uh, Moritz explained. So typically the size is about 1 to 1.5 centimeters of the osteotomy and it's somewhat parallel to uh, the lower leg I have. The lower leg is in somewhat uh, 15 degrees of internal rotation. So this is the same play now. I do my first cut of the osteotomy. Now we need a saw blade in here just to mark the first step of the osteotomy. This is about, I would say, two thirds to create a handle. So now I angle my saw blade. I angle it a little bit more meter, so I have a step towards the cranial portion of the greater to handle. Small. And now we have a small chisel here in order to create the step and you actually just have to cut some of the, the cortex and a little bit of bone here. Spidermeisel. Now you can lift up this fragment medially as you can see. Huh? Give me a and home and dine. One second. Like this. So probably now you should see with the camera. You see the step, Pinzette? The step is uh, towards the cranial portion, of course, of the greater dohander. And this helps correct anatomical reduction later on for screw fixation of the greater dohander. And it also adds to stability of uh, the greater dohander for the after treatment. Yes. Klaus, can you show us the most posterior fibers? of the gluteus medius that we would like to have intact here during the osteotomy. It's like a safety belt for you regarding the vessel. That's true. So you have like the lower level is either external or the more, I would say medial level is either external rotators here. And this portion here, that is still, it's a tendon, this portion is still attached to the greater dohander. So this is my safety belt or safety line. So this has to be cut not with a saw, this has to be cut now with a knife in order to be able to anteriorly retract the muscles and to, move, to further mobilize them. Okay, while doing so we can just have a look at the presentation to uh, recreate a little bit the step cut. So the step cut is uh, made in a way that you really have a step that uh, prevents a cranial migration of the unstable trochanteric fragment. So proximally, you usually have about three-fifths three of the greater choke hander that is cut. And distally, you have two-fifths that are left over. And the saw blade is typically always towards the floor. And the step is usually five millimeter thick. So then it really get, really get some stability of your trochanteric fragment. And since we have done that, we basically uh, have no problems anymore with healing of the greater choke hander and also with uh, problems of anatomical reductions. Back to Klaus. So probably I would not say no more, but very few. So the, the rate of uh, secondary, of non-union or secondary trochanteric displacement is lower than 1%, I would say. So now very important step. So I have mobilized the gluteus medius anteriorly here and uh, freed most of the trochanteric flip. 
So now very important, I have to reposition my leg. That means we take the leg off now from extension, internal rotation into a more neutral position here. And even a little bit external rotation, you see the fibers and muscle attachment to the bone until they come up now. So we don't mess up pinzetta. So now we have to release. We have to release again vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius muscle from the, uh, the proximal and anterior aspect of the femur. You see, that's especially the intermedius muscle going up the anterior portion of the intertrochanteric area. Klaus, we just have a small question from uh, Mr. Ahmed Said from Belgium. Uh, he was asking whether a step cut can be done with an open physis. Uh, technically, yes. I would say it depends on the age of the patient. I mean, I've never done probably in a four or five year old. Um, I would be cautious to do so if it's a patient like a nine, ten year old. I don't think it makes a, a problem. The physis is... A, is uh, about closing in the greater trochanter or not very active anymore. Actually, I have not done it, no. So I think, uh, fortunately, also these type of fractures are extremely rare in children. Maybe I can add the original description of a surgical hip dislocation it has been done uh, by Gibson. This is, uh, I th it was around, I, th I think, the 50s in the last century. And he has done the same approach, and he had not performed an osteotomy, but he just cut the entire tendon of the gluteus medius, just as Lutonel described it in his extended iliofemoral approach. So that's one other option, but I think it's less attractive to cut an important tendon like that and try to get it back to heal. But it, has been described and is an option maybe in extreme cases. So. Klaus, this is a very nice view now. Maybe we can go back to the presentation and just recreate how this view is done. So this is how you have to move the leg now. So you do some flexion and external rotation, which then gives you some access to the anterior portion of the joint capsule. And this is what you finally end up with. So you have post here again, uh, the short external rotators, uh, which are still attached, if not torn during, during the accident, which are still attached to the greater trochanter. You have mobilized the gluteus minimus and the gluteus medius muscle and the lateral, uh, the vastus lateralis muscle anteriorly, just to expose the joint capsule. Maybe some, something about the, this uh, tendon, po most posterior tendon of the uh, gluteus medius muscle that has to be cut. We did some examinations and some uh, checkups of those patients also with MRI and we did not see any drawbacks regarding fatty atrophy of these muscles. So the quality of the muscles is not impaired by this type of surgery. I just put in a homer now which would not be necessary actually uh, during real life surgery but just I try to extend the field a little bit for your view. So this, uh, hope, but it can be done in real life surgery. It's uh, put in, a, in the ilium above, maybe noch ein schmal langen back. Just to get a better exposure for you, I try to hold back the fatty tissue posterior. So now, flexion, external rotation, as you have shown, we look, we see the joint capsule here. This is all joint capsule, that's the femoral head in here. So we see already the joint capsule from posterior superior superior, anterior, even anterior, inferior. It could go even further, but it's not necessary. So this is like 180 degree exposure of the hip from externally. So now I will do a classic set-shaped, um, sorry, a capsulotomy in order to open the capsule. Actually, if you have posterior and superior rim fractures, you will have laceration of the capsule up here or in posterior. So in this situation, you will alter your capsulotomy. You will do alternative incisions just using this traumatic lacerations uh, in order to, to keep capsule attached to your fragments. If you don't do so, you have to risk the fragments become necrotic 
and won't heal. So here the first classical limb of capsulotomy is along the axis of the femur towards uh, the head of the patient. The second one will be along, along the intertrochanteic area towards the calca. And you do this careful under visions, you always see where the tip of your knife is, especially going in here, but also towards the labrum, because you don't want to do some uh, iatrogenic damage to the labrum. So what's helping now is to bring the leg into more flexion, external rotation. That's you, flexion. Yeah. And probably you can see already inside the joint. I see the labrum, I see the head, but I will expose it more. So it's easier to see. I go even more inferior with my capsulotomy. I go more anterior. And now I will need what we call a giraffe. And this goes, see the instrument here, it's a double curved retractor. This goes over the anterior rim and exposes entire acetabulum inferiorly. Now we have done two limbs, pincette mesa, two limbs of a capsulotomy, and the third one is going posterior here in this way. I always lift it up and I see or watch for the labrum. I don't want to cut into the labrum. That's all the way posterior. So now we have the joint exposed here. Klaus, before you are going to do the dislocation, I would like to go back to the presentation uh, where you can see a little bit in more detail also how this uh, capsulotomy is done. So the first cut usually is done along the axis anteriorly or anterior superior, typically towards the anterior superior edge of your trochanteric osteotomy. The second, con the second cut goes down towards the calca region. And the third cut is close to the acetabular rim and then runs posteriorly. And there is a reason for that because you want to protect your retinacular vessels as much as possible so you will leave typically this flap attached to uh, the greater trochant or to the, to, the, to the femur. Maybe just one short thing about some questions that, uh, that uh, came in. If there are questions that are being answered typically um, already during the later portion of the webcast, then I won't really answer them directly because they are self-explained afterwards. And if there are some other questions that we have that we can answer right now, we will do it right away. Back to Klaus. I can show you the dislocation now at this moment. You have seen, we ha I have not cut any extra rotator so far. The only thing I've done is mobilizing gluteus medius minimus muscle or vastus uh, musculature. So you don't need to cut more just for dislocation, for fracture treatment, we have to go still to the posterior side, as i show you in a minute. So now first step is to have some extension, external rotation, like this, and you see how the head pops out. Sorry, it was already very easy, and it's a little bit older lady, so typically, stop. Uh, we use this curved gynecologist, gynecology scissor to go around the ligament and cut it inside, in older patients like her, this uh, is rather weak and may just be torn by, by dislocating the head. So this is complete uh, dislocation now, and the leg is brought into a sterile bag on the other side. Give me an easy rider. I have another large, a rather large retractor we put around the posterior horn in order to get the femur out of the way. So flexion and push it towards me. So now we have an entire view of the acetabulum. In order to show you the acetabulum, we have prepared an arthroscope and can show the acetabulum a little bit closer. This is also what we routinely do during surgery. If you want to evaluate what's inside uh, the hip joint, 
you can document it and see it very nice with this arthroscope. Klaus, before you prepare the arthroscope, maybe we can go back to the presentation and just show how this would look like. So we have uh, the hip flexed in 90 degrees and then it's a kind of externally rotated and it's put into a sterile bag on the opposite side of the table. And the view that you can have afterwards is exactly as you can see right now. So you can see basically all over the femoral head and you have a 360 view of your acetabulum. Back to Klaus. We have prepared an arthroscope. So now you see the entire hip joint. You see the uh, labrum circumferentially. You see the fossa on the, on the bottom it's 6 o'clock. On the top it's 12 o'clock. No? So that gives you the complete overview over the acetabulum. I can see very clearly, but just to show you, I use the arthroscope. So what you can see now is the defects, marginal impaction, free fragments in the joint, whatever you have, and typically the damage is posterior and posterior superior. Um, for, for the next step, we have to reduce the femoral head again. So you pull again, some internal thing. You reduce the head, we get the leg back out into extension and internal rotation because now it's okay Let's just leave it you just push against the knee that's all so one way if you have just a transverse fracture no? now you're on the posterior aspect of the acetabulum up here on the bone this is the way to the greater sciatic notch if you have just a transverse fracture here no, you can work on the fracture just uh, tunneling the external rotators or pulling them Digitally. But if you have comminution and multiple fragments of the posterior wall, you will do what I do now. That is, I will take off extra rotators like the piriformis and the triceps coxae, which is gemelli, and the obturator internus. But you never, ever take off the quadratus femoris here. You don't need so. And if you would do so, you will harm the vessel and risk an AVN. See, that's a clear interval between quadratus femoris and the more cranial external rotators. So before doing so, I tack the tendon first. Makes my life easier also for refixation. And uh, one important rule not to damage the vessel is that you stay away from the posterior aspect of the greater to handle. So, claim it. And the scissor. Maybe at this point we can uh, go to the presentation and uh, have some information mm -hmm. how far away the vessel actually is from those insertions of those tendons. So this is a view from posterior uh, on the proximal femur and uh, you could see that at the level of the piriformis tendon uh, there is about a 9 millimeter with a range of 4 to 16 millimeter range uh, distance to uh, the insertion of the, glute of the piriformis tendon. At the level of the obturator internus tendon, it's about 12 millimeters away from the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. And at the level of the less trochanter, it's about 18 millimeters more cranial. Back to surgery, Klaus, I think you are just about to uh, mobilize the obturator internus tendon. Yeah. Um, actually, I tagged the two tendons. One is the piriform is on top, and the other one is in between the gemella, it's the obturator internus tendon. I opened a little bit the gap down here between the quadratus femoris muscle, overlying the obturator externus and the cr more cranial uh, external rotators. So I tacked the tendon and now I will cut it, just as you told, as you have uh, explained, I'm away like 1.5 centimeters from the greater to handle. I cut them all through. The point is uh, you can reattach, refix uh, the tendons, but you cannot reattach successfully muscle. So the gemelli will not be reattachable, so you have to take the tendons for reattachment. So I have it like in a package here now. That's all the cranial external rotators which you actually 
retract more posterior. Klaus, we have a very important question from Anas Elzibay from Ireland. Okay. Uh, he's asking whether with the greater trochanteric osteotomy and with all this preparation around the vessels, you would ask, add more risk to an AVN later or uh, what is your experience with that? We have not seen it because uh, we have not seen increased risk of AVN, not at all. We don't see it in hundreds and hundreds of safe surgical dislocation for non-fracture treatment. It's extremely rare and I would say it's always due, uh, at least if you don't have a trauma, it's always due to a technical error. In trauma, of course, you have, uh, you have fractures like the transverse fracture with posterior wall, community posterior wall fractures. They are typically associated with posterior traumatic dislocation. So we have a certain rate of, uh, we'll have a certain rate of AVN, but we have not observed it. And we will show later our first data from uh, more than 60 patients, more than 10 years, none of them has shown an AVN. And uh, a large amount of this, sorry, a large amount of these patients had a traumatic hip dislocation. Now I would need a raspy. So I think an important message is at this point that with this approach, with the correct anatomy of those external rotators, with taking care to, uh, to the blood supply and knowing exactly where the artery is, you don't really add another risk of, uh, of uh, additional uh, damage to this uh, vessel. It's exactly the contrary, basically. So we really protect the vessel as much as possible by knowing exactly where it runs. We have another question, a short question. Do you use the cautery to prepare something of this or is it usually a sharp dissection as you do right now? Uh, it's a typical sharp dissection. Uh, when I use cautery, that's uh, mostly for the inferior capsular to me because there's always some bleeding from the capsular vessels. This is where I feel a little bit more comfortable or around the bone on a femur here. But um, actually, I would say 95% is just sharp dissection. So what I want to show you now, uh, I have shown you uh, we can dislocate the hip. You see I have even extended the capsulotomy posterior so we can see the femoral head from posterior. It's all exposed here. Uh, this is down to the ischium here. I have retracted the quadratus femoris. It's intact. The vessel is intact. The vessel is protected by the stumps of the insertions of the external rotators. And just going with a bland retractor, I fall into the lesser sciatic notch down here, and I can fall and have exposed the greater sciatic notch up there. So in the greater sciatic notch, you have to be a little bit more careful because the sciatic nerve, as well as the superior gluteal vessels are exiting. So can I get uh, the big, i show you the big retractors we use. This is the Ischias retractor. Yeah, that's a kind of a huge retractor. retractor. Still, I think, from the period of uh, Lutonel. And this goes easily in a larger sighting notch. It's, it's kind of self-holding. So my assistant can sleep for a while. And then I need an EFA retractor, a smaller one, into the lesser sighting notch. Um, see, like this, no? So I think we should have a very nice exposure now of the entire retroacetabular surface from the ischium. The spine is actually here, the ischial spine. I think you can see that. Huh? Yes. Retracted here. And uh, this is now where we first would wo work on a posterior aspect on the fractures. So I think you have probably prepared. Uh, yeah, just one more question okay. uh, from my side. So people are interested to know where exactly are the vessels entering the femoral head. So can you just show us on the femoral head, maybe even dislocate it, in a dislocated position, where exactly this retinaculum is? Uh, okay, uh, I would like to do this later. All right. When we go for reduction. Um, but I can uh, answer so far, the vessel comes up from the front, just at a, somewhat at a level of the superior portion of the quadratus femoris. Then it crosses over the obturator externus tendon and runs very close to the neck cranially underneath the gemelli muscles, underneath the piriformis. And at the level of the piriformis, it, uh, it perforates the capsule and enters the hip joint. I will show you the retinacular vessels later once we have dislocated the head again. 
Very good. I think we should just proceed now to some reduction techniques. There are different types of manipulation that you can do with this type of uh, surgery. So the big advantage is, again, that you have a direct view into the acetabulum, which is not always possible or not entirely possible through a cochlear Langebeck approach, even if you do a trochanteric osteotomy. And there are different techniques how you can address and reduce those uh, dislocations. One and the, a very easy thing is just an intra-articular manipulation, as you can see here with a spreader or with a chisel, you can try to disimpact those uh, fragments. You can also directly address those fragments with some smaller hooks and temporarily fix them. One good instrument uh, is always the, the shunt screw, which is put into the ischium. That's something that you can also do with the classic approach but you can also put it into the anterior column and this is uh, very helpful in cases for example where you have a T fracture where the anterior column is still mobile so we will be able to address during with the head dislocated to address the uh, dislocation of the anterior portion here very nicely. You can use Jungbluth clamps which can be put on the posterior aspect uh, at the posterior column side or also at the anterior column and you can use some other instruments, for example, like this, uh, this collinear clamp, which can be put right into the teardrop figure, so with a direct control uh, of your reduction, and also to apply some compression to your fractures, typically if you have a transverse fracture. Now I'm going to show you how this looks like in a sawbone model, so you can really get an impression of how it looks like. And afterwards, we'll go over to surgery, and Klaus will do the same reduction maneuvers and fixation maneuvers that I've shown you uh, right now. So we're going to go over here to our plastic or sawbone model of an acetabular fracture where we're going to show you some kind of reduction techniques and fixation techniques. And we have prepared for you a transverse fracture here with an associated posterior wall fracture. There are two fragments here. Uh, sometimes they are multi-fragmentary. We have prepared some with two fragments here. So the typical dislocation in those uh, fractures is a medial and posterior dislocation. Maybe if you can go to camera two, then we can see this a little bit closer. We can see here the posterior dislocation and typically the fracture is dislocated kind of posteriorly, especially when the patient is lying on the lateral decubitus position. And um, this is what you can see during surgery, what we've just seen before. This is appropriately the area um, where you have access to including the entire uh, inside of the joint. I mean we maybe can switch to camera one once again. So we have the entire view here on, on the joint. You can feel with your finger, if you go around the sciatic notch, the references on the inner portion of the pelvis, maybe camera two once again. And you can try to reduce this, frag this, this fragment or the lower fragment with different techniques. One is just with a bone hook around different orientation or locations. So you can reduce the fragment if you go to the sciatic notch here. You can reduce it if you go to the sciatic spine. Or you can reduce it by going into the teardrop, which is only possible if you have this approach that we've just shown you before. You can also use some kind of classic clamps, like we typically use with a classic uh, cochlear langebeck approach. Um, but the big advantage is here that you can directly assess and check the reduction intra-articularly with the head dislocated. So this is how we can apply and reduce the fracture posteriorly and hold it with your reduction clamp inside the sciatic notch. Okay, thank you for a nice model. The point is we don't have a fracture here, so this is why we took the model. But now I have exposed all these uh, areas uh, you just saw also in the model. Again, this is the ischium. Now you, you will see here the sciatic spine. This retractor here is in a lesser sciatic notch. This is in a uh, greater sciatic notch. That's all the retroacetabular surface. And usually your transverse fracture line are 
around here, sometimes a little bit deeper here, or a little bit up here. So reduction maneuvers, if you've seen one of the first steps I usually do is to put in a shan screw in a, an, in the ischium here, and this is mainly to control rotation of the inferior fragment. You can uh, palpate very easily the fracture here around the greater sciatic notch with your finger. So you can go through the notch, just take care behind there's the nerve and the superior gluteal vessels, but you can feel the quadrilateral plate and displacement. You can put a hook around here or in the inferior notch in order to manipulate this fragment or the lower fragment, the inferior fragment with the hook. We have this uh, angled reduction clamp which has been designed to go into the greater sciatic notch and on a stable proximal portion of the elum in a transverse fracture you can reduce it through the greater sciatic notch. And uh, another tool we frequently use is this young blue, blue clamp, which uh, is placed very close to the medial border of the posterior column, just here, in order to have still space for screws or a plate. So with this clamp you can manipulate in different directions and get it leveled or anatomically reduced, and then your first screw preliminary will be from cranial to caudal just to hold um, the transverse fracture line in a preliminary way. You can put one or two screws here angled about 45 degrees inferiorly. So this is probably the first step, or it is the first step you do, typically in a transverse posterior wall or T-shaped fracture, try to reduce the posterior column by this way. Then go into the anterior column and watching or assessing the displacement of the anterior column, you will have to displace and uh, to dislocate the head again. Sorry. Now, Einzinger. Pull again, external rotation, please. Let's see again how the head is out. So, stop again, internal rotation. Somebody asked uh, Moritz about the vessels, right. the retinaculum, so I think I can show it to you at this moment. Okay, now can we switch to the arthroscope? Very good. So this is the cranial aspect of the femoral head. This is anterior, this is posterior here. So you see, actually, you see the reddish tissue here. This is the retinaculum. This would be like 12 o'clock here. You see that the retinaculum here, the vessels are entering at the posterior superior portion of the head. So this is perfectly intact. Now, no harm to this area. And underneath, see the vessels go underneath. Uh, these are the stumps of the external rotators. This is the piriformis tendon, no? I cut. So they're all protected in here. So they go in here, come out from here, perforate uh, the capsule at the level of the piriformis in the end of the head in a, in a five, with five, six terminal branches. So we will never hurt them during the surgery. So we do dislocation again. We bring uh, the leg into the sterile back, we put an easy rider. Okay. So, Messo nochmal. So get a little bit more light. So we are assessing anterior column displacement here. And uh, we are not only able to assess it, we have the clamps, like a vapor clamp, or give me the hook first. Uh, we have uh, some tools. We can go with the hook around the teardrop down here and mobilize or move the inferior fragment. We also can use the pointed vapor clamp here can bring it around inferiorly, around the inferior horn and sorry and cranially on a supraacetabular portion like this and squeeze um, or close the anterior fracture gap. Another tool might be helpful sometimes is the collinear clamp, as you have seen before, we can put it into, into the teardrop and then we can counteract a supraacetabular 
and uh, squeeze the two fragments together. So once you have done this and have reduced your anterior column, you, leave, you can leave this in place. You can place it a little bit more posterior, for example, like this. You're able also now, twill, you're also able to put in an anterior screw like this. Klaus, before we are going to do that, maybe just let's recreate it on the sawbone model, what you exactly did here, because sometimes it's hard to, uh, to understand in a three-dimensional way where exactly you would place those clamps. We have now prepared a second model here uh, with different uh, types and strategies of reduction. Some very simple tricks. One is this classic shans screw, which is put into the ischium here, which can be uh, uh, used to control the rotation of the fragment, of the distal fragment here in this fracture. With the surgical hip dislocation technique, you have also the opportunity to put a second joystick in. We used here a 2.5 millimeter uh, K-wire just in the non-cartilage portion of the anterior horn or also in the fossa. And this can also be used to help uh, reducing the fracturing regarding rotation. A third strategy is the Jungluth clamp, which we have mounted here, which is fixed with two screws on the posterior column. And with that one here, we are also able to uh, reduce and control the reduction and also apply some compression. And I will fix it right here. And you can then see that we have still a gap in the anterior portion here of the transverse fracture. And this can be reduced with different type of clamps. One is a classic Weber clamp that can be put around the inferior horn, anterior inferior horn, and the superior portion of the acetabulum. Which can then be used to apply compression and reduction of the anterior portion of the transverse fracture. Then there are different options to fix this with screws. One option is to go from the stable superior fragment here into the unstable inferior fragment. It's an interfragmentary screw which should be used first. It's important that you put the screw and those reduction screws here away from uh, the posterior rim of the acetabulum so that you still have space for your plate, which will start here at the ischium and then go all the way up to, to the posterior rim here to the supraacetabular area. A second screw that can be used to fix the anterior, uh, the anterior column is the anterior column screw which runs approximately in this direction here. The entry point is uh, about four centimeters cranial to the superior or posterior superior rim of the acetabulum. And it's located in the medius pillar here of the uh, pelvic um, or innominate bone here. And this would be the direction. And you can control this intra-articular screw pathway or extra articular screw pathway by direct observation through the surgical hip dislocation. There's a last way uh, of uh, another clamp that we can use to reduce the, frac the fracture, which is the so-called collinear clamp, a clamp that can be used in the teardrop first and then fixed to the posterior superior aspect of the acetabulum in a way that you can apply compression to the transverse portion of the fracture. Okay, we have exposed it now a little bit superior, that means uh, the supraacetabular portion. I put in another retractor 
So uh, we're looking, the head is displaced, dislocated again. So we're looking into the acetabulum. And now with my drill, as uh, Moritz just showed on the model, I'm about three to four centimeters above the acetabulum and pointing or aiming at the anterior inferior horn. So uh, we also have the arthroscope in the hip joint to show you how we can control um, our extraticular screw placement. So if you switch to the arthroscope now, now we switch to the arthroscope, okay, on the image, please. Away from the camera to the scope. You see it's a throw over here. Here's inside the acetabulum and he will check uh, whether we are fine or not. No? And you see this is uh, would be a wrong placement of the screw. We know we are in the wrong way. We are too much in the joint. So one way is now we have to redirect the drill. One way is, of course, now we have intraarticular control. We know we are safe or we can place it safely extraarticular. We take the scope out, but we also will need the image in. Now, so the image machine has to come in now. Just bring the image in here, as you can see now. Okay. While we adjust the image, so this will be a view like an obturator uh, uh, view and a, a tilt in quarterly in order to see the course of the anterior column. While we place and install uh, the image machine, Moritz will have time to answer one question. Huh? Okay, there are some more questions um, that we have here. One is uh, from uh, Vipul Makwana from India. For how much period we can keep the head dislocated? Uh, well, I can't tell you. Uh, the point is we keep the head dislocated um, for as much time as we need to. And it's not always dislocated during their entire surgery. So sometimes you have to put it in back, check the reduction, do some maneuvers maybe with the head relocated, dislocate again. So it's a little bit of play, uh, a play system where you have to change and be a little bit flexible. Some of those techniques or most of those techniques can be done even with the head dislocated. For example, another question was, from Alex Jacob in India, where you can put, if you can put a Jungblut clamp on with the head dislocated, so that is possible. Um, maybe Klaus, are we now ready with the fluoro? Yeah, can you show the image? You see the empty acetabulum since the head is dislocated, and this uh, tool is pointed again towards uh, the acetabulum, so we have to redirect it. Can I have another image? Very good. So you see now this is clearly anterior to the round circle. The round circle is the acetabulum. So this screw or this drill bit will follow the anterior column. So we are sure we're in the bone with the image and we're sure it's out of the acetabulum since we see this from the inside. There are several points that need to be mentioned here. One is whether we always use the fluoroscope in this situation. The answer is uh, no, we don't always use it. This was just for an illustration here. Or if you're not sure whether you come too medial with your screw, um, so you can double check it. But the basic idea is that you can just put your screw in in a way that you have the anterior comb under direct vision. Very good. So you see, this is where the screw would go in. I just put in our K wire so you see the direction. Uh, it's along the axis of the anterior column. And um, can I noch mal den Ischers retractor haben? There was this other question. Can we put in a young blue clamp with the head dislocated? I would say in most cases, yes. If it's a very obese patient or a very muscular patient, you may have some problems. Eva? But I show you the head is still dislocated. Uh, I can put in my retractors, as you can see. Again, here is the sciatic spine. In here, we have one retractor underneath the head. Here, you can see that. And there is a large retractor in the greater sciatic notch. So young blood clam, young blood clam would go easily here. I'm really down to the, the, the ischium. So this is, sometimes it helps when you put a hook around the 
femur and just sublux or hold it up in order that it's uh, not sitting and riding on your inferior fragment. But you see, you can manipulate in this way and you can put in your screw from cranial in this situation to preliminary stabilize uh, the posterior column. So anterior column has been reduced, has been fixed with a screw. We reduce now, relocate the femoral head. So you just pull a little bit internal rotation. So it goes very easy. Bring it back on the table. I think that's okay like this. And you see here now, um, can I have my blade and Krishnodrat? The last step would be to reduce the posterior wall fragments or superior fragments. You can do it partially with the head outside. The last fragment, typically we have the extra articular landmarks over here. We place uh, uh, as the last uh, cornerstone or the last uh, piece of the fracture, we place it back in. We have temporary fixation with K-wire here, K-wire there, and then we can uh, uh, put in one or two screws in a, in a fragment to, to hold them. And the screws are very close to the rim. You can relocate, re-dislocate the head and check that it's really uh, out of the joint. And your blade, you typically then, keep my langen back open, is a curved reconstruction blade which will be put on the posterior column in uh, this way. You see it's, it's curved and this is for the, the ischium down here and uh, you bring it in here. Halter, right? So you have it placed on the ischium and it follows the curvature of the posterior um, wall and it's holding back the wall fragments as well it's a, it's a neutralization blade for your transverse or T-shaped uh, posterior fracture component. Thank you very much, Klaus. So I think we should also show this in a Sabo model right now because it gives you a better imagination on how these screws are placed and where are the retractors placed too. So we'll just move on to the Sabo model, which we'll do right now. So we have now our third model where we already have done now our reduction. And I would like to show you now the sequence of the screws that we are typically put in into those types of fractures. So the first screw that we were mentioning already before is this screw here. It's an interfragmentary screw which comes from the stable posterior superior fragment into the unstable distal fragment here. It can be done a little bit more uh, superior as uh, this portal shown here which is an alternative depending on the fracture type and uh, size that you have. It can be uh, any position in this area here. Then we have the fixation of the anterior column, which is typically done with this uh, anterior column screw here. It typically starts, as we said before, about four centimeters cranial to the posterior superior rim along the pelvic uh, or the, the medius pillar here of the pelvic bone and it can be controlled directly under vision with the head dislocated and then you can check if you run into an intraarticular problem or not and I will just screw this one in and you can see on the inside of the pelvis that we are running along the pelvic brim here, which is okay. And if we look at the outside of the pelvis with camera one, then we can see that we are nicely uh, extra articular with this screw here. The next screws that are typically put in are the two screws that are fixing the post here wall fragments. Initially, we we'll just fix them with a K wire temporarily and finally put a screw in into both fragments. At the end, you have to remodel or model a, 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 a reconstruction plate here that is fixed into the ischium and in the superior area here as a neutralization of your reduction and fixation. Last but not least, you have to do a final check of your extra articular screw placement by dislocating the hip once again I'm just checking if you really have all the screws extra articular. 
we haven't mentioned one thing, which is the treatment of additional pipkin fractures through this approach, which can be done very easily uh, with a great overview also on reduction and fixation. And it's typically very comfortable to fix those fragments if they are anterior inferiorly, which is very hard to address through a Koch or Langenbeck approach. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this very nice surgery. Thank you. We have some uh, questions online that just got in. And uh, I would like to ask you some of those questions or some of the most frequent questions that are uh, typically here asked. One is um, about heterotopic ossifications. Do you add something about prophylaxis of heterotopic ossifications? Or have you seen more heterotopic ossifications with this approach compared to the classical cochlear langebeck approach? Uh, second answer first, uh, I have not seen more than with a classic cochlear langenbeck approach, but there are. It's quite um, a, a substantial number in total, but it's rare to have really a high degree, high grade of ossification where you need further surgery. Uh, second, I don't use it routinely. I use it, however, more and more, a prophylaxis against heterotopic ossification, which is indomethacin for two weeks. Typically, it depends for me how much mu uh, muscle damage you find. If the muscle is severely damaged by posterior wall fractures or uh, displacement, I do a careful debridement and uh, do give it. So probably in the, in the majority, I will have it. Okay. Uh, another question that came in is, what if you dislocate the head and you see there is a large damage of uh, the femoral cartilage, which probably will lead to an unfavorable result. Can you do a total hip replacement through this approach? Yes, you can do. I mean, this is like uh, the very early experience with total hips was th through a trochanteric flip osteotomy. You're there, you can do whatever you like. And uh, if it's an old patient, severe comminution, I would just go ahead and do the total hip in the same sitting. Okay, what are the special instruments that we use so that are necessary to perform this type of surgery? You mean now uh, the safe surgical dislocation with osteosynthesis? Yes, not oh. just osteosynthesis, not just fixation, but also approach. Are there special instruments that you need to order or is it just any regular instruments that you usually I have on the table? I, I would say they're at least on your shelf, maybe not on all tables, but uh, <laughs> they're very uh, uh, simple retractors as you have seen. I mean, it would be the same retractors just performing a standard total hip, for example, and you need uh, the large or broader uh, soft tissue retractors. Probably the most uh, important thing you may have you know, for a, a dislocating the femoral head is this curved gynecology scissor. That's very helpful because it's very tough to get around the head with a knife and try to, uh, to cut the round ligament. Okay, another question that just came in is how do you fix the trochanteric osteotomy afterwards? Typically, and I would say always just with two 3.5 millimeter screws, there are no washers required. Um, if you place them correctly, that means you have to be sure to perforate the, uh, the second cortex and the screws have to be long enough, this will work. Okay, so the last question is probably just for a moment is, do we need a traction table? That's the first question. The second question is, um, can you use a traction table to dislocate the hip? Well, for surgical dislocation, we do not need a traction table. You can do the Koch-Langenbeck in a prone position on a, uh, on a traction table. That's possible, and if it's a standard case with a large single fragment, easy fracture, you can do, can have the similar results, I think. But if you plan to do a safe surgical dislocation, you have to be in a lateral position. There's no room, no space for a traction table. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can just show you some case now or some pitfalls also of this technique. When you go to the presentation, this is just a case that we've seen right at the beginning. It's a 39-year-old woman uh, with this posterior dislocation, fracture of the right acetabulum, a, uh, a, a, a fragment that is going very far uh, superiorly, and on the right side you can also see this impacted fragment here. And this is the three-dimensional model of this fracture where you can see that it's really comminution of the posterior wall. Uh, with some impacted fracture that are really hard to treat. And you can see in the mid how this was treated with the postoperative image. And finally, this patient presented with a good two-year follow-up. This is actually how we would like to have it. And interestingly, so this is the intraoperative view of this patient. Um, interestingly, we see quite some severe cartilage damage, as you can see on the right side. And this is certainly not 
good visible through cl classical Hulangobeck approach, and we see more of those damages in the anterior portion of the, as of the femoral head. And, and um, this is really has come to a point where we really need to pay attention to. The left side, you can see how uh, the, the reduction can be assessed just visually. Here's another case similar to what we have just uh, shown as a demo before, a case of a posterior wall fracture that was fixed. And after this occasion, we recognized that one of these screws were really intra-articular. And this can be solved through uh, very easily just to, through an exchangement of the screw. Here's another case uh, where we treated in particular the femoral head fracture uh, of a very young case. You can see how nicely uh, the references and also the femoral head is visible. Basically, the entire femoral head is visible and can be fixed and with, uh, with those screws. Here's another case. Uh, with, of a patient that had a both column fracture with an impacted fragment posteriorly and this patient was fixed through an anterior approach first and on the post-operative CT scan uh, we recognized this, uh, this impaction which was still there and which was then finally addressed through a surgical hip dislocation with an anatomical uh, uh, reposition and reduction of this fragment and fixation. And this can maybe be the future um, when we have a very young patient like this patient, a 23-year-old male patient that had a very severe damage of the femoral head, then you can start doing osteochondral uh, uh, transplantation from the area of the femoral uh, neck where you sometimes can find a pretty decent cartilage that can be put on the femoral head. So at least you can, you can offer some option of cartilage treatment through this approach too. And this is a case how not to do it. Fortunately, I can say it was not done at, uh, at our department, but it's a very instructional case. It was a, a fracture that was fixed through a trochanteric osteotomy and dislocation. And you can see on the post-operative image that the trochanteric osteotomy was really entering right into the, the retinacular vessels, which finally ended up in uh, an AVN after eight months. And maybe some words on the long-term results. Uh, we have uh, followed more than 60 fractures over a follow-up period of 12 years. And we have compared exactly the same fractures um, as they would have been treated through a Kocher, classic cochor langebeck approach. And we could see that in those fractures, which are usually very difficult to treat fractures, um, we are certainly not worse and certainly probably better then with the classic cochran langebeck approach because you can address all those points that have been mentioned right at the introduction very easily. Okay, maybe we have some questions left. Somebody um, from India who asked, do you cut the ligamentum teres and is it dangerous to cut it or not? Um, as you have seen, well, I couldn't cut it today because it was just ruptured by itself by taking out the head. You have to cut it, you have to take it out in order to have access to a, uh, the entire acetabulum. It's not dangerous. We have learned the blood supply is dependent on a meter circumflex artery in these branches. This uh, vessel is preserved so there's no danger and it's not contributing to uh, essentially to the blood supply, at least not in adolescents and adults. Okay, maybe one last question. Do you still use the classic Hochelangebeck approach? Yes, there are s clearly some indications. If it's a large single fragment posture wall fragment, I think it's okay to do so if you have good references on the cortical bone, I think that's sufficient. Okay, and then maybe just one more because they are entering here uh, every single second, um, which is good for us because we like to have this interaction here and it's very good to have this direct feedback uh, online. Uh, one person asked if you have a, a, a fragmentation of the quadrilateral surface, can you address this also through this approach? No, there are limits, there are clear limits to this approach. Like uh, in any approach for acetabular fracture surgery, you cannot treat all fractures with a single approach. So if you have to go to the quadrilateral surface, you have to do another or an additional approach, which is uh, typically a small approach on our hands from the front, either a stopper approach or we use uh, since a few years we use a pyrorectus approach. So you have two approaches, same time, and you have the patient somewhat floppy or mobile to do this in the same session. 
All right, thank you very much, Klaus. Thank so you. So now we need to have some take-home messages, which are the most important facts here. And maybe Klaus, you can tell us what you should take home from our presentation. So thank you, Moritz, giving me the last word. So the messages we want to give you home with this uh, presentation today is it is a powerful and safe approach and in my mind it has considerably expanded our uh, treatment knowledge and also capability. Um, it will still continue to, to uh, lead to novel reduction techniques. You have seen there's an issue about treating cartilage defects, especially on the head side, and I think this has to be addressed more and more. And I'm quite positive that the improvement of long-term results will follow by this. So at the end, I want to thank especially the lively audience and your lively participation. On the web, we have a, a huge amount of questions. I'm sorry we could not address all questions due to lack of time. And I also want to thank the AO team, the AMTS team, and all the surgical team in here. They did a great job. Thank you very much for staying with us and have a nice day or evening wherever you are in the world.